Hey everyone, uh, thanks so much for joining in for this panel. I'm really excited to be here and I'm super excited to see so many people out. Um, this, is, this is awesome. But before we jump into our webinar, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. I'm in Hamilton, so I'll offer a land acknowledgement for uh, the land I'm on. And I encourage everyone to do the same in the chat. Um, so the city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, huron Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. For those of you I have not met yet, uh, I'm Sunil. I work as the land linking and new farmer support specialist with the NFUO, which was a new position created back in October to pick up on the land linking work that had been led by Eric McBay uh, that the NFU has been doing for about two years now. Um, this workshop in particular is the last of a three-part series put on jointly by the NFU Ontario and the Ontario Farmland Trust. Uh, we're super grateful for the support of the Greenbelt Foundation to put on this workshop and uh, really thankful to be a part of the AGM as well and to the AGM sponsors. Since we have a larger audience today as part of the AGM, I'll start us out with a bit of context on the land linking work that we've been doing so far. And then we'll hear directly from a farmer with a successful land par partnership, a land seeker and a land holder with the goal of kind of painting a picture for you all of what land linking is like right now in Ontario. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna give you all a bit of context on the work we've been doing, uh, but I, I, I'm gonna try and go quickly so we have as much time as possible for our speakers. Uh, if you have any questions or wanna talk with me more about anything that I go over, just shoot me an email. I'll put my email in the chat and we can arrange a time to talk uh, in greater detail. Great, so we have had uh, the incredible opportunity to learn from uh, some really successful uh, established land linking organizations in places like BC and Quebec here in Canada, and then also California and Vermont, New Hampshire, the Northeast in the States. Um, and one of our main resources that we use is uh, this, uh, the Young Agrarians Land Access Guide, which was developed in BC and then adapted for uh, Ontario context and outlines strategies for training, skill development, business planning, land leases. It's a really great tool. Um, another one of our major tools is this farmland matching questionnaire. This is, uh, this is what we use to help build our database um, of land holders and land se seekers. And we also do a lot of reaching out to retiring farmers and regional organizations to try and build out that database and find those landholders who want to share their land. Uh, I'm going to share the links for both of these documents in the chat um, just for you all to check out. And if you are a landholder or a land seeker, I definitely encourage you to fill out this questionnaire so we can get in touch with you. Um, so we can use this database to kind of map out landholders, land seekers, and make matches uh, where, where it fits and to try and help facilitate these, uh, these land partnerships. Um, through this work, we have had tons of conversations so far with land holders, land seekers, and folks with successful land partnerships to try and learn how can we replicate that success and what can we learn from those successful models. So we've identified some barriers and some keys to success. Uh, barriers we've identified are often centered around the urban rural divide uh, since most new farmers are coming from urban centers. So barriers are things like access to transportation to the countryside, which kind of is coupled with a lack of urban farming lots inside of cities. Um, another barrier coupled with that urban rural divide is a sense of isolation when uh, relocating to rural areas. We've also seen that skill development can be a barrier since most new farmers don't come from a farming family or a farming background. There's a ton of investment that has to go into 
building the skills to be a successful farmer. And uh, the, that training can be difficult to access. Um, that being said, we've also uh, been able to identify some really awesome keys to success. So on the land seeker side, um, established business and farm plans, prior farming experience and connection to a farming network or community like the NFU or the EFAO or just food in Ottawa uh, really helps to support successful land partnerships. Um, specific to the land holder side, an internalized desire to activate their land or a sort of moral desire to support new farmers can also be really key to a successful land partnership. Um, we've also identified some focus areas for moving forward with this work. Um, we want to increase our outreach and support for new farmers engaged in farming that's not necessarily uh, market garden type farming. Uh, so farmers engaged in grain growing, livestock or dairy farms. Um, we've, uh, we've kind of heard from folks that this is an area where support uh, and outreach can be lacking. Um, we also want to focus on use of social media as an outreach tool to spread the word about this new project to new young farmers and also to landholders. Uh, and lastly, we really want to look forward to coalition building uh, amongst other land linking and farming organizations in Ontario to increase the capacity uh, of our organizations by working together and tying in all these supports. Um, so that's, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, please feel free to, uh, to get in touch with me if you'd like any more information uh, on that on that context. And with that, I am going to uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Chadwick Lewis, who is the operator of Urban Fresh Produce in Ottawa. Um, and he'll be speaking from the perspective of someone with a successful land partnership. Uh, so Urban Fresh Produce is a black owned urban farming operation located at the Just Food Community Farm in Blackburn Hamlet in Ottawa. Uh, urban Fresh was founded by Chadwick Chadwick Lewis, who is originally from St. Lucia. He farmed there for two years with his great uncle on the family estate, producing over 25 different crops. Chadwick is also a graduate of the Al Algonquin College Horticulture Program. He has a passion for cultivating the land and in turn, providing others with healthy food options. Thanks so much for coming out and talking with us today, Chadwick. No problem, Sunil, glad to be here. Hi, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little nervous. Um, yes. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I put down a few pointers to remind myself of what I need to um, chat with you guys about. Um, let's go from here. Um, it's not really that nice. Not a Lincoln journey. Um, I'll start with my support systems because... Um, and that was one of the biggest things that really helped me stick it out. Um, to join with some of the stuff that Sunil was saying, um, it really is challenging for new farmers to really stick it out for a number of reasons. But um, let's talk about the positives first. Having um, a lot of family support, um, physically, emotionally, sometimes financially, uh, a lot of mental support and keep going, that kind of thing is very important. Because um, any entrepreneur will tell you that it gets lonely, it gets tough. But in farming, it's doubly tough because then you put the plants in. Sometimes you see you come in, you put everything in, they're growing fine. Then you go home, the next day you come back and half your crop is gone. And that can just break your heart, you know. <laughs> but then having people to support you is really important. Uh, my mom, who is not in Canada, has provided tremendous emotional mental support and encouragement, wise advice, very sage advice to me on, you know, just, just believing and keeping the belief up and keeping the faith up. Uh, my beautiful partner, Paula, I'll show you some pictures um, with her planting as well, has been very much uh, an, uh, uh, a mentor to me because she's been in business for herself for over 12 years. And that really helped because um, there's so many hats that you have to wear as a, as a, farmer as a business owner a farm business owner any business owner that sometimes it gets overwhelming you go home from a long day and you just want to sit and do nothing but then you have to answer emails you have to get clients you have to send invoices 
and there's so much that you need to be doing. And she was on me. She's like, that's what you got to do. I'm working on my business now. Let's let's do it. Sit next, get your laptop out, sit next to me, you know? And, and sometimes it was annoying, but I really appreciated it because it helped me to get into the mood of, well, this is what it is. And this is how you have to stay on top of things, you know? My in-laws, which you'll see in some of the pictures, would come out. Um, whether they actually, they would come out and harvest sometimes, help out with um, bed preparations, or just sit there and, you know, make 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 the work go by a little bit better by joking and laughing, that kind of thing. It just helps having, bringing, making it a family uh, affair to the next extent. Well, that helped me. Um, another great support system is just Food Ottawa. I mean, I, I wouldn't be here without them. Mo, Phil, very, very, very nice people. Not just um, outwardly, but generally, like you can have a chat with them and they will be on their honest about where they stand, but they're always willing to help. And that helped out a lot. Um, just with as an organization providing the land, providing infrastructure like um, tractors, BCS, various um, things that you would need to use at a certain extent that I didn't, I would never be able to have to start my business, um, providing access to a greenhouse for me, um, which allowed me to also have another aspect of my business where I do seedlings, organic seedlings. Um, that was fundamental in helping me to be here for this second season. Um, and I would say also maintaining a clear vision of your goals, what you're trying to accomplish is a big thing. Because yes, I would get down, I would need to pick me up from someone else, but because I knew I wanted to accomplish, I know what I want to accomplish, it keeps, that vision still keeps me sort of centered. So that little nudge helps, but having a vision also helps you to stay on it. And that's what's helped me tremendously thus far. Um, yeah. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, my challenges here. Um, as I heard, well, one of the biggest challenges was startup capital. Um, I, had, I had difficulty initially finding land, and, um, but I'll talk about it a little later on. Um, because of my startup capital issues at first, um, it, it mean, meant that I got my irrigation supplies ordered later than normal, and they were back ordered. So for a long part of the season, I was watering by hand. And you'll see some of that. I believe I have some of those um, photos or videos of that. And imagine watering 200 foot long beds with hoses, it can get tedious, especially when you have 10 to 15 of those beds that you need to water, it gets to be a long tiring process. So that was one of the challenges for my first season that I learned from. Um, finding the right market to join, that is key. You need to choose your markets, um, not just based on, for me, not just based on where it is, but also who are the other people that are going to be at your market, what the space is like. So I do one of the Ottawa markets, uh, um, York Street Extension of Buy One Market. And I chose that because they were having, a, number one, they had a BIPOC initiative, and number two, this market is producer only. Whereas some of the other markets, you have people who just resell the produce and they, they bought it in bulk somewhere in Ontario. And you can't compete with their prices. And it's not fair to you as a farmer to even go to those markets because then you go there and people are like, why are you selling it? Well, I know where it came from. I grew it, but they don't want to hear that. And it, you, you can find yourself in a haggling game where you're undercutting yourself and suffering the, the losses that you, when you just leave, because people don't want to pay what you just leave deserve for your produce. So choosing the right market was a very important thing that I, I had to figure out. I did two inish. I did also Parkdale Market, which was also run by Ottawa Markets. But I think that York Street Market was the best environment for for me as a farmer because of the, its producers only focus, which means that everybody there actually grows their stuff or produces what they have, so they know what it is to, <laughs> to where it comes from and how much it really costs. Um, exhaustion, well, that is a, a really big one. Um, the physical exhaustion is to be expected, so I'm not even going to touch on that. But the emotional and mental exhaustion that will that will that will hit you silently. You won't even realize that you 
you you you you you drained and you're burned out. But if you don't prepare for that and you don't plan for it, it can hit you hard. And um, I didn't initially plan for it, but thanks to thanks to my thanks to my support system, my family and everybody, I was able to, you know, get through it and 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 figure it out and plan better for this year. Um, and of course, navigating the rules that being an entrepreneur includes was a lot for me. Um, but I heard something that Sunil said, and I want to touch on that a lot. Um, some of the training, particularly the business part, getting your planning up and knowing how to plan for your season is very much lacking. I mean, on the go, being there next to other farmers and asking for advice is good, but you having a plan ahead of the season, a proper plan and understanding how that plan um, is gonna help you is priceless and it's really difficult without um, proper training to, to implement a plan for your first season. Um, and this is one of the things that I had to face. I had to really make changes on the fly while, in, while going through the season and learning from other farmers, learning from what's happening in the markets, learning, okay, this didn't work last week, but when I do this, it works better. And it, 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 it made for some, it added to that, emotional and mental exhaustion a bit because you have to really you want this so you have to make the changes so you stay competitive and um i think that's one of the biggest challenges is not having adequate the right uh, training the right focus in the training there's a lot of trainings but they're not focused on the parts that really can help you and at the same time part of it is just that you need to get your feet wet there's no other way to really figure out what you're going to need unless you try to get in there and you start just doing it. So there's there's a mix of the two, but I think that some training, some improvement to the training setup is needed or access to training for new farmers and new entrepreneurs is needed. Um, I believe that a lot of young people would be interested in farming. I had two young men from, two young um, um, youth who were in high school who helped me out this season. And they, they, they'd never grown anything before. But the, the thing is when you, the, I think the effect of seeing something planted, seeing it grow, seeing it yield, has a profound effect on anybody who's ever been around it. And it did have an effect on them to the point where, you know, they really, at first, having to water by hand was a tedious task and they would be frustrated with that at times. But being able to see why we were doing it at the end of it and seeing the fruits of our labor literally really did change their outlook on things and I think that's one of the things like more farmers getting into the, the business because of um, I think training um, youth to believe that this is a viable career from early is going to help make this food security situation much better and help improve our food production within Ontario a lot more if we can start to expose them in different ways. Maybe it's a, a little work exchange, co-op, whatever it is, but that's just my thoughts. Um, <laughs> deciding to be a farmer. Well, I think I was about 21 when I decided on that. And um, yeah, I was, not in, I was not in Canada at the time. I mean, I, I visited a few times, but I was in St. Lucia. And um, one, of my, one of my uncles had died a few years before, but he had a, set up a garden for my mom. And I remember saying she really wished she was around to take care of the garden. And that got me into taking care of the garden. And then I just started to love it so much. I was like, you know what, I really want to do this some more. I want to be a farmer. And then she suggested to me that, why don't you go to the family estate? Your great uncle's there and, and whatnot. But I wanted to do everything properly. So I became a registered farmer. I did all that. And then finally, when I met with my great uncle, um, I worked with them for over two years and the rest is history. I moved there, I did the horticulture course and um, well, 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 now we're here. <laughs> um, finding land was a bit of a challenge for me. I will say that was one of the biggest challenges I had to deal with because you ask a lot of people and you get a lot of mixed advice. Some people, even family members, some family members were like, they don't know. Um, I don't know where you'd find land. Not in the, you wouldn't find land in the city. Another thing that I heard Sunil mention or 
to look on Kijiji or look on Google or Facebook Marketplace. And the thing is, you you wouldn't find what you're looking for. It's it's a bunch of outdated listings sometimes getting turned around. Even friends would say, I don't know what you, you should do. And, it, and it, it would break you down. But I kept trying. I kept asking a lot of questions. And I, one of my lecturers was the one who actually suggested Just Food to me um, while I was doing my horticulture course. And I think she brought me, she brought us to one of those conferences, an EFAO conference. And um, I was able to meet Phil. And um, that happened. I kept the, the connection. I, it was the winter, so there was nothing to, to be done at that time. I went through, I did my schooling, I did my co-op, and I had to have a volunteer requirement to complete my course. And I was like, you know what, Just Food is a nonprofit. why don't I volunteer with them? So I volunteered with them and um, broached the subject of me um, aiming for having a plot there one, uh, soon enough. And um, from there we kept working. I did a lot of work on the greenhouse renovation. It wasn't all me, I must say, but then, and that was how the opportunities oh. came around, just being there. Surprisingly, that idea with that whole plan that I just, you know, volunteered with them and then all that was given to me by that same lecture. She's like, you should volunteer with them for a while and then see if you like it. So I think one of the things that people need to realize, especially the land journey is that it's not always an instant thing. It takes time, it takes commitment and you do have to pay your dues. You do have to commit to, you know, putting in something first, because why would someone just give you land to work and they don't know what you're capable of or they don't know your work ethic. So it does take some doing and some commitment just to look for it, number one, finding the right connections. And then of course, you have to give off more of yourself as well to show what you're really about. Because farming is a hard business and no one wants to give land to someone who's going to say they want to commit to it and then the next year they're like, you know what, this is too hard and walk away. Because that, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of investment of time, money, everything. Um, and that's that. Um, I have a lot of pictures I want to show you guys, but before I draw, I'll tell you some of the keys to success that I've had, particularly with Just Food is a lot of communication, lots and lots of communication, effective, honest communication. And sometimes that can be difficult for me. It, it, you know, um, having a being Caribbean, you tend to have a lot of pride around being vulnerable and not wanting to be vulnerable about things and be open about your shortcomings or things that are challenges that you're facing. But this has helped me and just food really be on the same page a lot because open communication is something that they've responded to and they always ask so they always say to you you know be straight up with us what's going on what are the challenges you're facing and and that has helped tremendously to help me to go ahead and um maintain a, a, a smooth relationship with them in terms of, of how of being on the land and returning for another season being adaptable and flexible is something that everyone who wants to be a farmer is going to have to be. Um, last year, I was a carpenter at the beginning of the season, building t benches for the greenhouse. You know, literally, there was nothing in there. We built all the benches ourselves. So there's a lot of things that you have to adapt to and, and be able to. You have, you have to be able to to deal with. You want to. You set up a planting date, and then you can't plant on that date because your delivery is not going to come on time. So you have to work around that. Um, there's a lot of things that you just have to be able to be adaptable on and flexible on, and that's what I've done. Chat, like, um, just jumping in here to give you a two two minute warning. You, you got okay, no problem. Right. Almost, uh, um, and respect for the space and for other farmers was a big thing. I'm just going to try to show you guys a few photos real quick. This was what the the land looked like at the beginning of the season. Um, this is uh, my partner. Um, we were actually pregnant at the time, um, trying to get um, some kale planted. Um, yeah, this is my partner, my lovely partner, Paula. <laughs> uh, these are my in-laws. 
you like I said, they come around, they help support, and we were going to plant some green onions that day. And we made some time for downtime at Niagara. Um, and I'm just going to run for a few quick photos of, this is the greenhouse stuff that I did. I'm just sharing my Instagram a little bit. Um, watering, some of the processes you have to go through. So there's a lot of stuff that we, you really had to do ourselves, do a lot of, this is another farmer on the farm. This is my nephew right here. Getting the kids involved was a big part. I hope you can hear that. So there's a lot of little things that we had to do. Um, this now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, and then this is some of the manual labor. Like at this point, one of the BCS machines was down. So we had to continue making beds manually. So I had to set up some drawstrings and um, really edge. It wasn't the straightest beds, but it helped me to keep going and to get stuff planted by a certain deadline. Um, these are some of, these are the two youth that I had working with me and, um, yeah, working with this plastic mulch was very difficult at first because then you need to weigh it down properly. Otherwise it can kill your plants. And I lost a lot of plants through that. And eventually there's even one of my beds where I just ripped it all out because I couldn't deal with it. Um, this was finally figuring out how to work with it and having things planted in it. Um, and this was another process of spreading the compost while doing the bed preparation. And these are like when things really started to get established. Nice purple peppers, nice hot cayennes, um, harvesting some spring onions, scallions, what you, whatever you will. Um, this is me, I was, I was doing some um, a garlic spray application because we're certified organic. And I just decided to share with people, knowing how to do the social media part is something that I think was lacking. Manual pest control was something that I was doing as well because this was on my eggplants. On the eggplants was important. Um, so, you know, it, it is a lot of different things that you have to figure out, but just keeping, through the, keeping with the process Having discoveries like this one, I believe. Harvesting nice peppers, just showing them how to, how to do it. Getting right down on the ground to do it. Yeah, among other things. And this is me at the market. Um, this was Parkdale Market, I believe. And um, this is some of the bountiful harvests after everything started to take off. So that's after all the challenges with the water and everything. This is this is where we got to. Um, I, I think my time is about up, but I really thank Sunil for giving me the opportunity. And I thank you guys for listening to me. I'll be happy to answer questions later if we have time. <laughs> thank you so much, Chadwick. If you want to, actually, you can throw your uh, Instagram handle into the chat, too, and folks can check it out uh, from home. Absolutely. Definitely. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was a really useful knowledge, really incredible. Um, and hopefully we have some time for, for Q&A afterwards. Uh, mm -hmm. So our next presenter uh, is a Toronto-based land seeker named Samir. Samir is a part-time urban farming hobbyist in the Toronto area, exploring opportunities to grow for market and tackle food inequity and disparity in his community. Following the path many have paved before him, including those of his late grandfather, he believes in observing, observing and working with nature to grow food organically and sustainably. His journey to learn more and do more in this space has most recently led him to attending a series of land linking workshops and connecting to local resources in the area to continue his journey. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it off to Samir. Samir, thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you, Sunil. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me share my screen here. Okay, so um, I think this will be a brief presentation as, you know, I am just getting started on this journey. Um, and so I don't have many years of experience to reflect on, but um, I have a couple of thoughts that I'll try to elaborate on in this um, brief presentation. 
And uh, definitely, I'm very interested to hear the presentation of my colleagues uh, or, or uh, panelists. Um, and, and the one that just that I just heard was was excellent advice as well. So thank you for that. Um, so I'll just go into full screen here. Okay, so first off, um, um, at this moment, I am uh, not doing this full time. I'm uh, sort of taking on the journey um, as a hobbyist. So I'm doing this on my free time, uh, part time. And uh, yeah, so, I, and I'm, I'm really got interested through the idea of urban farming. Um, so being able to uh, grow food within uh, a community, within a city um, on a scale that's large enough that it would feed my family, myself, friends, et cetera. Uh, and that's kind of how I got into it. And very quickly, um, I realized that I am, uh, you know, uh, would need to scale to be able to get to that next level. Uh, and not necessarily that land seeking is the only way to do that in terms of looking for more land. Um, I, I think there's quite a lot for me to learn even just on the size I'm on right now. But uh, it's, I think, the natural progression for me. So I just thought would get started sooner than later. Um, now, the one thing I want to highlight here is, of course, I have very limited knowledge and experience in this space. Uh, every day is a learning experience. And um, I... Um, uh, you know, the more I think I know, the more I realize I don't know, and it's 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 crazy how how much is um out there. Uh, in particular, you know, looking within organic farming, uh, you know, there's there's so much we um, think we we're gonna do that's gonna help, and then nature just throws you a curveball and says, oh no, no, you shouldn't have done that. So it's better sometimes to do less. Um, so it's it's very interesting uh, uh, experience as we go through it. The the other the other thing here is um you know. Uh, even though I have limited knowledge and experience, I, I would say I'm very quite passionate about growing food and I'm willing to continue to learn um, as I go on in this journey. So I, I think, um, again, the gentleman before me spoke to this, uh, you know, it's, it's very taxing mentally, emotionally. Um, so, you know, if you're not passionate, you're probably going to get weeded out very quickly. I probably wouldn't have been here talking in front of you after a couple of years of experimenting. But, um, you know, we'll see if, if I keep going after that, because, you know, the more land you have, uh, it just gets harder from there. So, uh, but definitely I, I'm quite passionate about, about this at this moment. Uh, the motivation for me is just, you know, first and foremost, having access to local, organic, sustainable food uh, for myself, for my family. Um, and, you know, like growing up, in my earlier years, I didn't really value organic food so much. Um, and, you know, some of the dishes that we grew, um, we had that my mother cooked for us, uh, I didn't actually realize was healthy. I, I was just saying, you know, oh, no, I don't want that. I want a burger. But um, there was actually some very healthy dishes that we had um, growing up. Um, and, you know, only when I started to get, you know, into the space a little bit more and, and read about the, the health benefits and see, uh, people in my community and, you know, family members and how, was, how food was affecting people in general, that I started to give this a little bit more thought and, and thought, you know, this, this is very important. Uh, the, the other second reason is, you know, I, I, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but I, I'm working right now as a consultant um, in Toronto. So uh, I don't spend a lot of times uh, outdoors, uh, not even close to uh, as much time as I'd like. So in my spare time, I do like to, you know, get on the bike, go out and, you know, take a, um, a, a spin around. And, 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 you know, sometimes I, whenever I have a chance, I'll go for a walk in the ravine with my family, but I don't have as much chance to do that. And, and this is another way for me to spend more time outdoors. And then the third and, uh, you know, main reason why I wanted to scale and get into this a little bit more seriously is because, you know, it's not just growing food for me and my family, but also those around me and community members and others I've grown up with here in Toronto that uh, have not uh, or still don't have um, as much access to good organic food as I would. Uh, so in my journey, I, I'd say like I'm yeah, I started small and I'm still quite small. Um, and you know, the one of the ways I've done this is just uh, looking to local resources. So you know, friends, family, anyone who 
uh, could lend me a section of their backyard, uh, um, I would start experimenting. And, and logically, the first place to start would be family members who can provide that. Uh, but then, you know, uh, the local municipality would also maybe perhaps have uh, a community garden or allotment garden that you could um, have access to. And um, knowing others who have access to that um, uh, afforded me the opportunity to, to work and experiment within an allotment garden. Uh, so I had a chance to, you know, and just transform a couple of spaces and it really, you know, was the aha waking up moment for me that, you know, it's, it's, it's really backbreaking experience to, you know, uh, move uh, you know, a certain number of cubic feet of wood chips into your property and um, compost into the area. But uh, at the end of the day, it really pays off and the results speak for themselves. Uh, so this, the second step for me was, you know, like as I was going along with the journey, I didn't want to experiment blindly. Uh, I, I believe in experimenting. I think that's a great way to learn. But I think it goes hand in hand with being able to see what's out there, learning from others, uh, looking at resources and connecting with others. And, you know, by doing that, I, I think you can shave off your um, natural amount of time it's going to take before you get really good at something. Um, so again, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm still starting off, but uh, you know, uh, one of the things we complain about here in this part of the world is we only have six months of growing season. Well, the other six months you can spend, you know, um, on off time, on, on a free time learning about all the um, great things others are doing. And in this age, when you pull up YouTube videos and all sorts of other, you know, social media, and uh, there's so many ways to get um, access to resources and see what others are doing and learn from others. And then finally, uh, you know, just it, through that experimentation, trying to uh, grow within the space intensely um, and, you know, if, uh, experimenting. And if you're going to fail, try to fail as quickly as you can. Uh, and so in doing this along my journey, um, I had a chance to grow various organic vegetables and herbs. As I mentioned, a lot of that was for personal consumption and use. And um, over the last, I would say, year, year and a half, I've been starting to really think about, um, you know, what use cases or opportunities are out there within my community that I could um, uh, uh, take this to the next level. Uh, and in that, some of the challenges is that I've had actually, you know, uh, I'm in the process of setting up a plan. Uh, and that plan needs to entail what are, the what are the challenges I'm trying to solve? Um, like, what's my business plan, essentially? Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to get into um, this kind of uh, commitment without understanding really where I'm heading um, and how I'm going to get there. So I'm, I'm still in this process, uh, you know, side by side with looking for land. I'm also looking to see, you know, um, what kind of uh, business plan I'm going to be able to realize. And in that, of course, the challenge is, is, you know, I have limited time, limited energy, limited resources. I mentioned I'm, I am working um, at the moment as well. Uh, so, you know, there really has to be some uh, flexibility in uh, how I'm going to be able to do this. Uh, and one key way for me so far has been just, you know, rallying up uh, support around me. So friends, family, uh, looking for others in my community that could step up and work with me uh, when I'm not available, when I'm not there. Um, and, and also just, um, you know, my own use of my time. Like, um, I, I don't think I uh, really can afford to sit down and uh, watch a Netflix movie if I'm going to be doing two or three things at the same time. So I have to really be um, creative around how I, how I spend this limited time, energy, and resources. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, if, if there's going to be a transition at some point, I need to account for how I get to the next stage, um, whether that's, you know, moving full time into farming or figuring something out where I could um, establish this a little bit more on a permanent basis. Uh, so just to summarize, um, you know, I'm starting small, I'm still small, experimenting and looking to scale. Um, and I'm doing this in parallel with looking um, to see what resources are in my, uh, in my area and uh, putting a plan accordingly to try to uh, affect back to that motivation that I spoke about of bringing uh, uh, organic food into uh, my community. Um, and 
uh, looking for creative solutions for some of the challenges I know I'm going to face and that I'm already facing. Uh, so that's it for me. Uh, look forward to any um, questions at the end. Thank you so much, Samir, for presenting and uh, bringing your perspective uh, forward for us. Really appreciate that. Uh, that was great information. Uh, for our next and our final presentation, we will be hearing from Marshall Buchanan of Ottawa Valley Farm to Fork. Marshall Buchanan is a self-employed farmer, mentor, community builder, uh, research consultant, and a registered professional forester. Since 1988, Marshall has been volunteering with not-for-profit community groups and organizing public events and workshops in the name of the common good. From 1997 to 2000, Marshall lived in the Northwest Territories and was employed as the coordinator senior instructor of the Natural Resources Technology Program, Aurora College, Inuvik. Working with Gwichin and Inuvialuit elders and students taught Marshall to use cultural diversity to build stronger and more resilient communities. Although his professional training is in soils and forest ecology, he is currently an entrepreneur in the agri-food sector and has invested, invented many gourmet convenience foods, some of which are now sold in local grocery stores. Marshall mentors employees on his farm and is currently navigating the Ottawa Valley Food Cooperative, Inc. through the pandemic as president. Uh, thanks so much for coming out to speak with us today, Marshall. Uh, really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Sunil. Um, can everyone hear me? Are loud and clear. You run in the presentation. Are you running the slideshow from your um, command post? Yeah, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to share on my end. I'll share my screen right now, and I'll just take cues from you when I should. Uh, Flip my slides over. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Sam. So um, I'm going to tackle this topic. Let's go back one slide, please. I'd like to tackle this topic of, about being a landholder and reaching out from, uh, from the part of my education that kind of brought me to this point. I'd like to go back to that previous slide please, the one with the trilliums in it. Okay, so the, as a, when we're thinking about our, our farm and our land, um, the, the way I farm and why I'm interested in landscapes and farming is because um, the, the, <laughs> there's just so much inspiration and a mystery in the way the natural environment supports itself and us that all the lessons we need to know as a farmer, in, in essence, are already being demonstrated in the natural environment. And when you look at, a, at any landscape um, that's not disturbed, there's a, there's something, there's a community of, there's, there's community there. So people that study ecology, this is called community ecology. And all the plants that are in that ecosystem are interacting and the populations form in these kind of natural associations 
and they're helping each other to thrive and to reduce leaks and to you know like nutrient loss and to shelter each other and to function efficiently and uh, when you imagine your farm your farm is kind of like one um, it's one kind of grove in an ecosystem of grocery stores and uh, connecting highways and cities and different continents. But your farm is literally part of a food web, both in how it produces its food, food and how it is part of the human food web. And so if we, if we can go to the next slide. Um, this is the kind of joy, this is the kind of, um, I just think that everyone who wants to be into, in farming does so because they're really inspired about this planet. And you often hear when astronauts go to space, they look out that little window and they see this, the blue dot um, and it's the only habitable place uh, in, in our, for light years around that we, where we can live. And a, a lot of people that have a strong land ethic, you know, you, you don't have to go to space to sort of have that epiphany. You, you can just look at the astonishing landscapes in which we live and marvel at how do those organisms survive for hundreds of years in demanding uh, environments. And they, they do it through all kinds of symbiotic and codependent and mutualistic interactions. And and that's a kind of a community in our natural ecosystems. And what I'm looking for as a landholder is to um, have those same kinds of associations uh, between um, farm operators and farm staff and, and other uh, farmers that just that want to be part of this. And, so I think if you want to be part of, a, of an organic style farm, then you already have a kind of a land ethic within you that might be latent, but you want to let that go. You want to let it, let it out and let it grow. So let's go to the next slide and explore this a bit further. So as I was growing up, uh, Whoops, that's a little quick. As I was growing up, you know, I would see um, the landscape. Oh, my, you're going, you're three slides ahead. No, I don't understand. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, only I get it. The program is doing that automatically. It's just yeah. kind of jumping ahead. Sorry, sorry, Sunil. So I'm thinking about, you know, everyone needs a place to live and we need a place to grow our food and we have to, um, conserve this, this uh, the resource and recognize the struggle. And in one of my previous uh, works as a professional forester, I was doing a lot of landscape conservation and landscape restoration. And I was looking to collect seeds from trees that were heritage trees and replant them in the Rouge Park in Toronto. I did a lot of work in the Rouge Park. And so every time I'd look for a tree, we can go to the next slide, I would be looking for a tree that might have the right, would be a good seed source. And I'm looking for this seed. Each seed contains that hope. Each seed contains the potential genetic um, resources that might make that next generation perfectly adapted to climate change. And, and if, we don't, if we don't let those seeds find a new place to grow and thrive, 
then these existing forests will never adapt to climate change. And so as I was collecting seeds for this, for landscape restoration, I was kind of searching for that next generation. And in agriculture, there's all kinds of pedigreed seed and breeding to try and develop, um, you know, properly adapted traits. Um, but I'm using this metaphor as in, uh, let's go to the next slide. I'm searching for that next generation of farmers in a way. And uh, this is from my other landscape restoration work. But this, this is a, a once upon a time when local really was much more local. And this is um, the, the horizontal line going through that picture. That's Highway 7. Most people, a lot of people in Ontario know about Highway 7. And the vertical line on the far right of the picture is McCowan Road, which um, uh, is very close to where I grew up. And you can just see that landscape and it's all been carved up into farming by the settlers. And, um, you know, the food didn't travel quite so far in those days before it got to a household. And let's look at the next slide because that's the same landscape today, essentially, the same picture. Um, and you can see that farmland is gone mostly and there's malls and houses everywhere. And I'm, I'm out here living in the Ottawa Valley now and I have a bunch of land and there's all these people growing up, ironically, on land that was farmed, <laughs> but now they have no land and they have no land to farm. And so we're kind of looking for that next generation of farmers and land stewards. And hoping I'm hoping that by land linking, I can provide a gateway to some of that, that lifestyle. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So as I said, I'm out here in the Ottawa Valley. This is one of these, you know, it kind of dates me when I, I like to look at paper maps. Maps. Anyway, you can kind of see I'm halfway, my farm is halfway between Algonquin Park and Ottawa. You can't quite see Algonquin Park on that map. Let's go to the next slide. And so anyway, I got into farming because I was running a tree nursery and the tree nursery <laughs> was to, to find the next generation of uh, native trees that, that can grow in the urban space. So we can go to the next slide there after this one. Okay, and so there we started farming. And um, this is, well, <laughs> I guess I didn't realize that I should have probably just run the PowerPoint from my side and shared the screen. I didn't know that's how it was being done. We can go to the next slide. So after living here for 22 years, we started off with the property where it says home which was 50 acres and uh, you know it was quite affordable that's why we bought it I, I think it's important uh, for people to know the price of land we got that 50 acres for ninety two thousand dollars in uh, in the year 2000 and it was a good choice because it gave you a dry a dry like a room with a roof and uh, a place to walk and breathe. And then over time, we bought other properties, which we would never have had a chance to buy because um, they didn't come on the market. They only, they were sold to us because we knew the owners. And so that's one of the challenges that urban people will find is a lot of land that does change hands, doesn't even get listed 
on real estate websites because they're sold to someone they know and and landowners are incentivized to do that because they get to save on the commissions that would have been paid so anyway we're trying to work so now we have all this land which i wouldn't have been able to buy except for my parents are passed away and so that enabled me to get more land, which, you know, um, um, it's just, you know, in a way is I've got this land and I didn't even succeed enough in life to earn the ability to buy it, but I, I, I own it now. Anyway, um, we're working on making a trail network that joins uh, all these properties and, and that could be a good part of our business plan. So, and different, each property has different uses. The Skyview property, that's mostly for hay production. Uh, there's a red pine forest on there. So I wanna manage the red pine forest. I'm gonna use the wood chips when I thin the plantation to create uh, uh, garden walking beds and uh, like trails between beds and certain types of mulches. Um, there's also agro-tourism opportunities on some of the properties. The, the Quiet Farm one, um, those were hay fields and mm -hmm. pasture land. So we, we use the pasture. Some of the smaller sections are going to be used for uh, asparagus production. And there's possibility to have... Uh, land seekers uh, stay on that property so they have some of their own privacy. The kitchen farm one, that's where we have a commercial kitchen. Um, you can't really see it on that photograph. It's just a small uh, home on there anyway. And that's, you know, on the main property, you can see all the, on the slide that shows home, you can see all those circles in the pasture and that's um, where we feed the cattle in the winter time and uh, we, you know, you put a bale down on a different spot each time and then it helps to feed the pasture and you can have this regenerative cycle going on and um, anyway, let, we can move on to the next slide. I'm just worried about time, so let's move on. And this is just a, another view, a wider view. Whoops. Oh yeah, there's sort of the bell circles. Um, and it's important, you know, if you're a landholder, you're trying to, you're you're trying to look at the the, if the role that the landscape plays, uh, the role that your farm plays in the landscape, and you can see all the forests surrounding and you're carved out these small little pieces of arable land. And that previous map showed class one farmland surrounded by forest and some lakes. And the great thing about farming in this part, in this geography is you're only 15 minutes drive away from a lake where you go swimming. So in the summer, you work till about two in the afternoon and then you go swimming and get ready for the next day. Usually, um, anyway, we can move on um, from this one. But the, oh yes, the idea of the sailing ship. Um, I've always thought, I've always imagined that the mission I'm on in life to, to live um, in harmony with nature is kind of like, captaining a ship and you're looking, you're, you're navigating this trek in your life and what kind of friends can you make along the way and who can come on board that ship and how can you help take people with you if they want to go on that journey with you and uh, that kind of thing. Hi, so, Marshall. Sorry, I think I'm just going to have to cut it there just so we have time for a brief Q&A. So sorry to cut you off. I know we're having some technical difficulties with the slides, but 
Um, we'll welcome you and Chadwick and Samir back up and we can do a, a brief Q&A. Um, so hopefully you have a chance to, to finish your presentation um, as, as part of the uh, um, Q&A section. Great. Thank you for that, Ashley. And sorry for the technical difficulties on sharing your slides there, Marshall, but thank you for the, uh, the presentation and the great information there. Um, so we have a couple minutes before we roll back into resolutions here to take some questions. Um, if folks have questions, you can either throw them into the chat just now or uh, raise your hand and uh, we can spotlight you so you can ask your question. Okay, we have a question from Brian Tammy, Local 351, and I'll pose this question to everyone on the panel. What are your best sellers at the farmer's market in the areas where you are? Um, for me, some of my best sellers are peppers, tomatoes, and scallions. Nice. Very good sellers. And herbs, of course. Um, herbs always sell. Marshall, do you want to add on to that? Um, I would say our, our best sellers are pierogies and sausage rolls. Um, and um, yeah, to, you know, to make the regular vegetables, but it, it always depends on what the competition has. <laughs> uh, but since no one else has pierogies and sausage rolls, we, we are the go-to place for that. <laughs> And Samir, I know you're not at a market yet, but I'm curious, what is the your, the most desired produce that you pull out of the garden for your friends and family? Yeah, I love uh, the rocket arugula. I mean, that one is, mm. uh, has a very spicy, unique taste. Um, and, you know, I, I think lettuce in general, people um, have, a, have a use for. Um, I personally like more some of the more... Um, hard to find vegetables like okra and uh, asparagus is on my list for this year as well. So some of the perennials um, I'd, I'd like to uh, experiment with. Awesome, awesome. Okay, I'm gonna give uh, a one final nudge for questions uh, from the audience in the chat. Um, other, otherwise, we're already a little bit over time. So we will hand it back to uh, our chair to keep going with resolutions. Um, um, Sunil, I think I think there's Maddie uh, had her hand up and also Katie, so. Oh, my mistake, my mistake. Okay, uh, Maddie, if you wanna go ahead, I will give you a spotlight so you can ask your question. Thanks, great presentations, everyone. Thank you very much. My question is around equity sharing. So a lot of um, you know, as both Chadwick and Samir spoke to equity, leveraging equity, whether that's inherited or accumulated, is a massive asset when accessing land. So I guess this is a question for Marshall um, and maybe Sunil as well from interact, you know, from your own experience, Marshall, and then Sunil interacting with other landowners. How are you sharing equity? Like, are you severing your land and offering it at like a dollar so there's something on the the bill of sale or whatever of of that land piece to you know land seekers is it a lease agreement right like it's also about security right i've farmed on leased land up until last season and every single farm business has folded because that relationship between land renter and land owner, whether it was an individual or a corporation, has been fraught and very insecure and quite precarious. So I'm really curious to, to see where equity is being offered um, from a land owner position. Well, I'm, I'm in the position where I haven't had a successful um, land seeker operate my 
land that I own kind of independently on their own. Um, I have had a lot of people kind of test drive the farming lifestyle. I, I even had a student today, she's 40 years old from Malaysia and she was, came to work in the greenhouse today. Um, so I'm looking at ways, I'm looking, I'm thinking that I'm probably going to set up a not-for-profit organization to operate certain aspects, certain parts of the land or landscape. And, and I think it could be like a, like a two-year kind of a um, learning track or something just because the reason I would like people to help help out is we want to increase capacity, we want to increase market reach, and we want this land to be productive in terms of supplying the local food marketplace. And I can't do that all on my own. Um, and so I need people that can help bring that capacity. And I would sort of carve off, I think, my private farm business and keep that separate. But with new um, tenured farmers or whatever could sort of work within a, a not-for-profit model, maybe. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm open to ideas still, you know, just because I know what, what's missing in this economy, like in this local geography, there's a certain mix of needs, but if you're growing here and selling into a city, the opportunities are, are different as well. So it's, um, you know, one, one angle is since I have livestock, if I want to focus just on the livestock, then there's all this nutrients and stuff that come from the livestock that can make your garden or the other gardens more, you know, there be, they would be regenerative. And, you know, the land's going, is on track to be certified organic. It's just, you know, it's just not there yet. Yeah, that's a really challenging question, Maddie, and I do not have a good answer for you, but I will uh, bring up the example of a model that I saw recently, which was a land seeker who was, uh, he had a bit of savings and there was an accessible, affordable track of land on Keeley Island um, that he was able to buy um, or thought he was going to be able to buy. So you went in, uh, did all of the work with lawyers, um, banks, everything at the end of the process at the last moment the mortgage the financing for the mortgage did not go through um so the land owner came back negotiated and said let's do a lease to own uh deal so i will rent this to you uh for it, it's a, a really reasonable price but it's a i think it was a five acre tract of land with no house or anything um so that means that the land seeker did not have to go into debt the total amount of money oh, that the landholder will receive is the same. They're just not going to get it as a lump sum. It's over the over many months. Um, so yeah, I don't have a good answer for you, but that is a model that I saw recently that I thought that's something that's accessible for folks. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate that question. It is something really important for us to be thinking about. Um, with that, I am going to bring up Katie. Uh, do we have time to take one more question, Chair? Um, yeah, let's uh, let's do a quick one, if if that's okay. If okay. Can, just yeah, go ahead, Katie. I'm I'm throwing you on spotlight, Katie. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I will be super quick. Um, I know that having participated in a number of land linking workshops over the years. Um, for those of us who are land holders who are looking to potentially match up with land seekers, one of our major issues that we tend to encounter is access to transportation, because much of the farmland, of course, is outside of where public transportation is. And of course, a lot of, uh, you know, new farmers these days are coming from <coughs> city backgrounds and, um, you know, that's, that's just a fact of life. And so I'm wondering if you had any 
thoughts for people who are actively looking to um, you know get farmers onto the land and start making connections because it it you're right it takes years to to do these transitions um, for Chadwick and, and Samir especially if you have any thoughts on how to sort of square that circle around physical access to the land and transportation um for transportation that is um quite a big challenge um for part of it we would rent u-haul vans so the seedling park um i know other farmers rent u-haul vans every weekend for their markets but it can be costly and uh, another part is just using family transportation a bit and then when you finally have your own, choosing the right transportation for yourself when you finally get it. At first I was looking to get into a truck and I realized that a minivan is way better for um, a farmer, a clothes van to protect your stuff. And then um, you want something that's also good on gas, hence the minivan. Um, in terms of land sharing and, and all that, I think it, it really is um, something where in my experience with it, even not just here, it, um, it's about really having a good relationship with the older generations and the younger ones. And um, it goes both ways because one of the biggest challenges I had with my great uncle was that they, they're set in their ways in a lot of ways. And no matter how respectful you are, they want to see things done in this way. But they don't want to understand that you also have some visions and to try to mesh the two. So... Being able to have proper communication, again, is what I'll go back to um, with landholders who are most times on the older side or more mature side. It's something that really needs to happen so that we can get better equity. You know, like, like um, someone said in the chat, maybe a, a, a long-term training process, like, okay, you're here for five years. After five years, we reassess and see if we like what you're doing and whatnot, but we, but everything has to be clear. Communication has to be clear at all times. If there's an issue, don't wait for it to, the season to end to complain about that because then, then it becomes so big that you, that, that you miss out on the opportunity to fix it and then actually have a great partnership. So I think that's something that needs to happen no matter what is bridging that gap between the young people that want to get into farming and the older folks who already have their knowledge that they and their ways that they want to do it. It, it. it comes from both ends. The young people kind of be a, the most, the ones always bound on. I understand the old people have more knowledge, but we need to work on both ends. You need to give us a little leeway to work because we are going to carry the baton. None of us can take the land and go, go with it when we go. So we really need to figure out proper stewardship, like how to give some guidance on why you want to do it that way. Don't just say, that's the way I want it done. And this is why, uh, and, uh, without explaining why, because this generation actually wants to know why things are the way they are, versus just, you know, this is it, my way or the highway. That doesn't work anymore. Thank you. Okay. Um, was... Oh, uh, is there one, Marshall, did you want to say a few words to finish up? I, oh, hopefully I can make some sense. I, I think that, um, you know, the one reason why I was thinking about the not-for-profit model, I think we, we need to explore what models work uh, because then the, the person that's test driving on your land, so to speak, or, or trying to run a business on your land could maybe get, have more of a safety net because if, because maybe they're, they're, um, uh, perhaps they could get a salary through the not-for-profit corporation structure and the food gets produced and it gets out in the community. And the idea is to avoid people being taken advantage of and to access the kind of grants to, to build the farm infrastructure um, by running, uh, by using that, that corporate structure to its best use. I think there's a lot of, um, you know, you know, there's a lot of people in this world that have good lawyers and smart ways of doing things. And I think in some ways, the sort of, um, some of the small operators haven't 
been able to use those mechanisms to their advantage. And it, I think it's something that might be worth exploring. Thank you so much for those final comments. And thank you to all of our panelists and to the chair for the extra couple minutes to do some Q&A. Really appreciate that. Um, uh, getting back to resolutions here. Thanks so, so much everyone for uh, the time to, to uh, tune into this webinar.